Hello everyone, my name is Olga Palacios and today I will talk about technological properties of different temporary materials in early Neolithic ceramics. That is part of my master's research thesis at University College Dublin. First, to start, I'd like to thank the Exarch organizers for their work and make this conference possible, and also a special thanks to Mariel McClatchy, Aidan O'Sullivan and Brendan O'Neill from the UCD for helping me out with this project. Different tempering materials were used by early agropastoral societies throughout Europe. As the case of Sari, we will focus today on the ceramics of southern Poland. The earliest agropastoral settlements in southern Poland are located in the Carpathians, and they date back between 5500-5400 BC, and they lasted, and this phenomenon lasted until 4800 BC approximately. One of the main focuses of study in this area are ceramic productions for their potential cultural affiliation, affiliations that can be investigated and also because ceramics can inform us about social organization and technological preferences in the past. Which is very interesting about the LBK period is that the same the three different typologies were maintained throughout the period, the tableware, the kitchenware and the storageware. But only their external characteristics were maintained. Their internal compositions of petrography gradually changed. As noted by previous studies, there was an almost disappearance of organic tempo in fine wear by the late phase. A similar pattern was observed by kitchenware. So, organics were gradually switched by another uh, type of materials, such as quartz or grog. That sets out a question. Why did they prefer organic temper in the earliest phase and quartz grog in the latest phase? What changed in society? If we look at current literature to understand temper change on ceramics, we will find that there are three different reasons for selecting a specific type of temper over others. Production-based benefits, which spe spe specify that by using a, sp a specific tempo, you will be able to improve clay workability, speed up the process of pottery manufacture. Secondly, we have performance-based benefits, which argue that a specific tempo will make the pot more suitable for use in a specific context. For example, cooking pot will have to stand thermal shocks, so temper type should go in accordance to their use. Social based benefits, um, accordingly to ethnographic studies, temper can be used to differentiate some pot from the others, which relate to potential affiliations and traditions. To explore this change, we designed an experiment to address the question why were organic inclusions substituted by mineral and ceramic additives in the middle and late LBK periods in southern Poland. To approach this, it was used an experimental archaeological method to examine the possible production-based benefits and performance-based benefits for using a different type of tempo. The first stage of the methodology was to prepare the raw material. Clay was collected from the Wicklow Mountains in Dublin and tempering materials were processed until obtaining a 2mm size. It was selected planchaf, emma spelt, bone and unborn bone, also dung, and then quartz and grog. The second step was modeling the specimens into two different shapes cube shape and bar shape. These types of shapes were selected specifically for the art technological test. All of them contained the same amount of tempa, 10%. Then they were all left to dry for two days and then they were all dried using an electrical furnace for one hour at 100 degrees to ensure that all specimens were equally dried. Finally, half of the specimens were fired using an electric furnace at 700 degrees for four hours and the other half amount in a pit hard between 650-750 degrees for four hours. The reason for these two different types of firing is that almost all of, uh, of the experiments on technological properties in archaeology use only an electrical furnace for firing the samples, as it is generally considered that in this way a more consistent results are obtained. 
However, we consider interesting to use these two different methods to compare and also test whether this assumption is true. Once they were all fired, the Vickers hardness test was applied to the cube-shaped specimens. It is a method uh, used for measuring the hardness and tensile strength through the specimen's resistance to plastic deformation. As you can see in the picture, there is a machine with diamond shape which indents into the specimen. By measuring the indentation, it's possible to determine the resistance of the sample. The second test was the three-point bending test, which measures the rupture strength through specimen breakage in the maximum load. It follows a similar principle than the beakers. The machine applies a force in the middle of the sample until it breaks, and then it measures the applied force considering the inner characteristics of the specimen. The last test conducted was the water absorption test to measure porosity and density. It follows uh, the Archimedean principle whereby immersing a specimen into a liquid, a liquid will impregnate uh, all pores of the specimen. So by comparing the weight before and after being immersed, you can measure the percentage of the pore volume of the specimen examined. Now I will talk about the results obtained. From the first stage of, the, of raw material selection and preparation, it was observed that they actually behave quite similar. The only thing was the time necessary to prepare the tempering materials. While onboard bone, quartz and shaft were very time consuming to prepare, at least 6-7 hours to, to prepare, the others only required less than an hour. By burning the bone, the process could be speed up considerably, although no clear evidence of burning this material for a temper has been observed in the LVK context. But we thought that it was an interesting aspect to investigate because most of the times it's not specified in the literature whether the bones added to the clay were previously born or not. So that is an interesting aspect to keep in mind. Regarding modeling and drying process, they all behave exactly the same. Interestingly, the specimens fired in a heart actually show a higher strength compared to the ones fired in a furnace. In the same line, more consistent results were obtained with the specimens fired in the heart. About the Beaker's hardness test, not very successful results were obtained. <laughs> as it can be seen on the table, most of them look as similar, and that's because the indentation was applied to a specific point of the sample, and most of the times that was the clay, which remains the same independent, independently of what tempo was used. It was not the, same, the most suitable test to measure strength, but I believe that it's an interesting one to present because uh, also because it was a negative result and it may prevent others to make the same mistake. Another takeaway of this test is that it's also not suitable to be applied to experimental specimens fired in low temperatures such as 700 degrees because as you can see, it was very challenging to measure the indentations as the petrography is not extremely clearly defined. On the other hand, interesting results were obtained from the three-point binding test. Two different groups can be divided, born bone, grog, pores on the one hand, and on the other, and bore bone, planchaf, and dung. That is because the first group presented higher strength, while the second group were more, more brittle. On the right, you can see that, again, more consistent results were obtained on the specimens fired in a heart. In the same line, in the water absorption test, the same group, grog, bone, bone, and quartz, had lower porosity while the other had a higher degree of porosity. Again, more consistency was observed in heart fire specimens. The results bring us to the next section, discussion and then conclusions where we go back to the main question presented in the beginning. Why were organic inclusions substituted by mineral and ceramic additives in the middle and late LBK periods in southern Poland? If we approach this question from the production-based benefits, we can define that all tempering materials were equally accessible except quartz. As for the experiments, we had to go specifically to collect this material. 
But in an LBK experiment, that would have been easier, especially if they were producing lithic tools as they will have quartz in form of byproduct. However, if we, if we approach this question from performance-based benefits, we have this group of bone, quartz and grog, which present a similar performance, low porosity and high fracture strength. On the other hand, dung and shav will be more brittle and they will break easily. Considering the results, we can hypothesize whether they had more resistant vessels in the last period of LBK while they will have been more brittle in the early phase. Another interesting result is that it was possible to dismiss the Vickers harness test to examine the effect of tempa on clay and to apply in specimens fired in a heart. And additionally, it disproved the extended, the extended assumption that only specimens fired in an electric furnace can produce reliable results in mechanical tests. Finally, I would like to thank all of you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, you can ask me or you can write me. Here you have my email address. Thank you very much.